Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Our guest today is Carl Potts, uh, who's been a longtime editor at Marvel. He was the creator of Alien Legion and many other uh, outstanding titles. In fact, uh, Carl created the Epic imprint, uh, which held sway at Marvel in the in the uh, 80s, uh, where creators were invited to submit their own uh, creator owned uh, books to the title. Uh, and a number of creators responded with some of their best work. Unfortunately, Mar Marvel no longer welcomes creator-owned books. Uh, but uh, Carl's uh, uh, tenure was marked by outstanding storytelling. And I remember when he asked me to write The Punisher, he said, uh, uh, the one thing I re require is that your stories make sense and that they be grounded in the real world. Uh, Carl was also a very talented illustrator. Uh, who has illustrated several graphic novels, including uh, the one about the dragon. What's that called, Carl? Last of the Dragons. The Last of the right. Dragons. Um, and uh, since leaving Marvel, Carl has joined the world of academe, and, and uh, I believe he's teaching. What are you teaching and what are you teaching? I teach at several schools. Uh, most of my work is at the School of Visual Arts in New York. I teach both uh, in person and online for them. And uh, I also teach online for Academy of Art University, which is based out on the West Coast. And occasionally I'll do classes at uh, Pace University, Manhattanville College. And um, I sometimes get asked to give my presentation on sequential visual storytelling at a variety of colleges and companies, including Google New York, uh, actually giving it, I give it, gave it at MIT, which was very oh, wow. strange. Uh, Princeton University, Syracuse. Uh, it's strange when I was uh, in high school, all of my schooling years and through college, uh, you know, saying you were in college was pretty much uh, academic and social suicide. Um, <laughs> Now, uh, you know, I get asked to speak at MIT in Princeton. It's very strange. Yeah. <laughs> Were you, do you live in New York? I live north of New York City, yeah. Um, by the way, I need to correct one thing. I did not create the epic line. Archie Goodwin uh, was the guy who originated, started that line. And when Archie left Marvel to go back to DC, I was asked to uh, fill his shoes, which was impossible. But um I decided to take it on because I thought there was a good chance that Marvel would just shut the line down unless somebody championed it and took it over. So, Well, uh, all us creators who contributed, thank you. Of course, Archie was one of the great editors in comic book. And one of the reasons he was a great editor was uh, because he was a writer first and he understood the business and he understood the mechanics of storytelling, as do you. Well, well thank you. I, I hope I, I uh, know it you know, at least a small percentage as well as Archie did. Archie was like, um, for those who, you know, weren't around long enough to know Archie and his work, uh, he was probably the most universally admired and liked writer, editor in the business uh, for decades. Uh, and uh, universally, I don't know anybody who's ever had a bad word to say about Archie. Uh, either on the creative side or the editorial side or the personal side. Uh, I recall you telling me one time that you guys would have games of touch football with Archie. Uh, I didn't partake in those, but Archie was a, an incredible practical joker. Uh, there was a period there where, you know, Archie and some of the other editors, uh, writers, editor writers who would often work late at night on the freelance work at home, would come in at, uh, let's say, not normal office hours. Um, yes. And uh, some of the people upstairs at Marvel in the administrative area wanted to um, enforce more normal office hours. And I think you had to be in by 9.30 or something like that or get penalized somehow, I don't know what. So that was the, the, the stick. The carrot was as if you came in before 9.30, there would be free bagels and cream cheese and all that stuff there. So, and everybody knew Archie, you know, often didn't come in until 10 or so. Uh, and uh, he, the first day that was going to happen, I guess it was a Monday morning, uh, they set up the whole bagel thing right outside of his office. And, 
everybody's hoping, you know, Archie's not going to be late and get in trouble. And uh, we're there, you know, putting butter, cream cheese on our bagels and watching the clock. And it goes past 930. And I think we're sitting there, oh, shit, he's going to get in trouble. <laughs> and uh, right after 930, the office door, uh, Archie's office door opens and he yawns and stretches in his pajamas in the doorway. He got in super early that day just to pull that joke off. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of guy he was. Uh, and anybody who's interested in Archie's writing, I would recommend uh, the Manhunter book he did with Walt Simonson. Classic stuff. That was just, uh, I remember when that first started being serialized in a, it was like a, a giant sized dollar book or something DC was doing. Uh, uh, they were having a lot of uh, reprints in the back of that thing. And they had like uh, one new Batman story and then the Manhunter backup. And I paid whatever the outrageous amount of money was for that thing, just for that Manhunter backup every month. Wow. It was great. Now, Carl, you started out as an artist. Yeah. Do you still draw? Yeah, but I don't draw a lot of finished work anymore. There's just no time. Most of what I'm doing is um, demonstrating for students or doing overlays on their work or do roughs here and there. Um, the last bit of work I did artwork-wise that was published by a major company was probably a year and a half, two years ago now, maybe. Yeah, the pandemic time thing has me all screwed yeah. up. Um, yeah. But um, I did that when Marvel did... Uh, Marvel Comics 1000 and then 1001, uh, they had a bunch of people do one page that had worked at Marvel. And they asked me to do uh, a single page. So I wrote, penciled and inked a single page of the alternate origin of uh, Peter Parker that went with a what if story I'd written shortly before that on what if Peter Parker had become the Punisher. They presented me with this uh, concept and asked me to write a story around it. So I came up with the idea that in this alternate universe that the, the spider that bit Peter in that radioactive uh, lab was uh, a thing called a uh, false widow spider, which is, uh, I think, in the UK and Europe. And it has, it's um, toxic. And on the back of the abdomen, it has these markings that often look remarkably like a skull. And uh, so I have that be the spider that gets irradiated and bites Peter. And that with the toxic effect alters his personality a bit than it normally would have been making a much more uh, violent prone for a while. Anyhow. Um, that's so cool. I, I have a, I have follow-up story ideas for that. If they, if Marvel ever decides they want to do that, I've, I've put that bug in their ear. You must have heard of Jerry Conway's recent comments regarding the Punisher. Uh, I haven't read them, so I don't know for sure. Um, but uh, I know there's like been a controversy about uh, the character's popularity in certain ways and all that. And uh, I actually agree with some of the, the problems. I, I do not think the police should be using the Punisher icon. The last thing I want my police to identify with is with a uh, a violent vigilante. The police are supposed to be part of the balance of power, uh, enforcing not to be judge, jury, and executioner. And um, uh, the last thing I want to see is my police cars driving around with a, with a skull emblem on it. I'm also, even though it's probably not quite as bad of an objection, I, I don't think the military should be using it. Um, you know, that skull emblem particularly related to the military, its biggest connection would be with the SS. And I don't want our soldiers being yeah. associated with the SS. And, you know, a big part of what helped win the peace in World War II was GIs being generous with the locals, with their, you know, handing out Hershey bars and spam and, and all that. And, you know, the idea of like some GI trying to be nice and hand out the kids, you know, wearing a, a skull, I just, uh, it irks me. I don't know if we ever talked about it this detailed on Mike, but my take on the character was uh, that he was an obsessed um, individual who his family had been rubbed out by the mob and he felt extreme guilt for not having protected his family. So he um, 
had this sort of death wish, and he took on not just the people who were immediately responsible for his family's death, but he kept taking on more violent criminals. And um, he took no satisfaction in it. Uh, he never, like, kicked back with a beer after a mission accomplished and, you know, felt accomplished or anything like that. It was just on to the next one, on to the next one. And at some point, um, you know, he'd be killed or maimed and uh, be rewarded for what he should have been rewarded with for failing to protect his family. And he usually denied himself any uh, personal interactions with others because on the few times he would do that, inevitably they would meet a horrible fate because uh, their association with him. Um, and it was like a cathartic, you know, you know, ride for viewers because uh, the, the character got to do things that we can't do in real life, which is, you know, go after some of these violent criminals that, that somehow escape the justice system and things like that. Never thought that anybody should ever emulate this character in that way, shape, or form. Uh, any more than I thought a kid should, you know, tie a, a towel around their neck and jump off the roof and think they're Superman. Um, but uh, once in a blue moon, I'd get a letter from someone saying, oh, I love the Punisher. I want to be just like him. And I'd have, oh, I'd roll my eyes. And I'd, I'd stop whatever they're doing. I'd, I'd write them back and explain to them that this is a miserable human being yeah. who... Um, uh, hardly ever solves any problems. More often than not, he just gets involved with or perpetuates or starts ongoing cycles of violence. Um, and, uh, you know, he takes no joy in life. Anybody he gets close to is usually not long for this world. Why on earth would you ever want to be like this character? And um, what worried me is that, you know, for every person that wrote in, that said something like that, how many others had a similar feeling but did not bother to write in. Right. So that's one of the reasons I tried to make the books, uh, anything I wrote or drew, uh, wrote you or edited, um, I tried to make sure they didn't glorify or make it seem like this is someone to be emulated. Uh, I never had to really talk to you about that, Mike, because that seemed to me you did that naturally. Uh, uh, is that Was that your conscious point of view or just you had something else going on or? Well, I viewed the Punisher as a guilt-ridden Catholic. <laughs> and uh, I felt that that he was constantly had a, this internal struggle uh, between what he was doing and, and uh, the faith that he wanted to observe, which is why he went to confession all the time. You're the one who established he had once studied for the priesthood. Have you seen the Netflix series? Yeah. What do you think yeah. of that? Uh, I like the actor. I uh, forget his name, Bernthal. John Bernthal. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like certain aspects of it. They they have him do some things, though, that I don't care for. Like when he was guest starring initially, I think, in, the, in Daredevil, they had a sequence in there where he's running through a hospital blasting away with a shotgun, and the version of the character I would have done wouldn't have done that. Um, and then there's a scene where he's, like, got Daredevil chained up on a rooftop and... Uh, uh, interrogating him and the, the building superintendent is trying to get up uh, there and he's on the other side of the door with um, uh, the Punisher and the Punisher's got his gun drawn ready to shoot this guy if he insists on coming through the door and the only reason he doesn't apparently is when he finds out that this guy was a former Marine and I thought it's yeah. easy so that's what it takes for you to not shoot this guy that's not the character you know I wanted to do so there are some things like that that uh, would bother me, but all in all, I thought there was it was a really good, interesting show and take on the character. The um, one of the seasons, the last episode, of one of the seasons where they're reliving what happened at the carousel before, uh, uh, yeah, got slaughtered. Uh, I actually got asked to be an extra on the set there, and I was there all day shooting over and over. But I ended on the digital cutting room floor. I never uh, uh, was in there, and I were they filming in New York. Yeah, it was supposed to be at the, the, the Central Park Carousel, but it was some carousel way out in Queens somewhere. And they 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 had like they put up these, uh, you know, magnetic flexible signs that said Central Park Carousel or something on it. And if the wind blew too hard, the corner of the magnetic sign would flip up. Oh, wow. And uh, there was a um, uh, like a, a snack hot dog stand there. 
And on the side that was facing the cameras, they changed all the prices to reflect more like a couple of decades ago prices. But if you worked around to the other side, the working side, you could see all the real prices. That's funny. It was, it was pretty good. I do think that uh, the Netflix show was probably the best depiction of the Punisher on film. Uh, and that the three movies that they made uh, were all misfires for one reason or another. And, and it stymied me because it seems to me the Punisher is a very easy character to get right. I agree. I, well, you know, it's weird. I do agree, but I also think it's strange because he's, he's basically almost a two-dimensional character, not a three-dimensional character. Right. And ironically, that's harder to screw up a two-dimensional character than it is a three-dimensional character. Yep. And... Um, I think in the movies, uh, that first one, um, the original script was much better than what showed up on screen. It was written by Boaz Yakin, who I have a lot of admiration for. Oh, and, I know Boaz. Yeah. And um, uh, it was uh, rewritten. You know, a new director came in, it was rewritten and all that. And, uh, I, you know, the idea of, of um, Dolph Lundgren just didn't sit with me and it was filmed I think in Australia for budgetary reasons and it's supposed to be like sitting on a motorcycle on Coney Island and there's palm trees in the background <laughs> it's uh but it just uh, the one I forget the name of the the main heavy in there that actor he was the only really good one in there second one uh Thomas Jane I like him he's an excellent actor uh, but that movie made no sense. No, whatsoever. it didn't. But there's no internal logic in that film. There was problems with that last one too. I like that actor. He was from, Ray Stevenson. I thought he was he the was, best of, he of was, the Punishers. He was in Rome, right? Yes. Or, yeah. Um, but it's like you know, he's living in the subway in this area that you're not supposed to be able to get into. Get into and apparently everybody can walk in there whenever they want. Yeah. Uh, uh, so. I, I, you know, I like stories, like what I said, with, you know, strong internal logic that uh, your suspension of disbelief isn't constantly being tested by superfluous bullshit and illogic and so on. I think that's essential to good storytelling, uh, that the, uh, the, you have to draw the reader or the viewer in uh, to a point where he believes utterly uh, what he sees that it, if it didn't happen, it could happen. I think right. that's the key to good storytelling. And my taste in, in uh, cinema these days is I have to believe that the story could happen, but that leaves room for a huge range of, of movie types. For instance, aliens. I love aliens because I believe it could happen. Yeah. Aliens is great. Also uh, the dynamics of the, the you know, that, uh, group cast in there, that ensemble oh, yeah. cast is just yeah. awesome. Superb. Yeah. Uh, interest in the Punisher remains high. I don't know if you're aware of this, but there are at least three Punisher groups on Facebook and they're both, they're all active every day. I don't know if you ever check them out, but they're crazy for anything Punisher and they're, they're all weighing the latest issue that came out by Jason Aaron. I haven't read it. I didn't read a, a lot. But, I mean, you probably are aware of this, Mike. I'm not sure if the readers were, but there was a period of time when uh, I was editing the Punisher, and then when I was going to write and do the layouts for Punisher War Journal, Marvel had what is normally a very good uh, policy that if you're a staff editor, you can't edit yourself, which I think is a great policy, except that the only editor that had room in their schedule to take on another book was this editor who um, I felt should never have been promoted to begin with. I thought he was pretty clueless. And um, initially I got no feedback at all from him. So I would give my plots to Ralph Macchio and he, Ralph was the uncredited plot editor on those stories for me. He'd, he'd challenge me and give me feedback and I'd go back and forth with him. Um, and then eventually that editor who was supposed to be the official editor uh, decided he needed to earn his pay. So he started making changes for the sake of making changes and, you know, six of one, half a dozen the other, if you were lucky kind of changes and sometimes detrimental ones. And he didn't have like that point of view I was talking about earlier on the character. He didn't have that nailed down. And um, there were a lot of people doing a lot of Punisher stories there. And the ones that 
like uh, Mike and Chuck Dixon, who had a good handle on the character, you know, their stories turn out good and a few other people, but there were others that he let write things in there that um, I think really took the character in the wrong direction. He basically took a thriving franchise and drove it into the ground. That's just my slightly subjective point of view. <laughs> was, was that the editor who took over for you while I was working on the book? Correct. I was gonna I was gonna pull us out of that <laughs> if we didn't put it out. but uh, I I will say and I, and I feel like that this is um, kind of what you guys um, did a little bit um, but I do like the fact of yeah like viewing him as kind of like more of like a tragic character and more like a, almost like a Shakespearean tragedy but it's almost and and this is one of the things that I got as soon as I heard the the music in the show um, was it was very cowboy music. So it was very much like kind of like a cowboy um, story and kind of angle that they were going going for that this, you know, terrible thing happened and then he's going to go get all the people. And at the same time, too. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of in in a lot of those stories, it's almost like a death wish, like he's going to take on, you know, he'd take on a whole army if he had to. But it's much like death wish. It's yeah. a cautionary tale about what happens if you let uh, right revenge and hate you know, overtake your life. And that's why I thought it was a cautionary tale, not something to be emulated. So right. I hear about people thinking they want to emulate that or associate with it. Uh, makes me very, very nervous. Uh, I just think some of the people are just thinking strong. Like I want to be strong, self-sufficient. They're, they're not thinking the deeper. Yeah. yeah, but this is kind of crazy strong. This is <laughs> it's like going off in loony land. The only time we did at Marvel where we associated with this was uh, the Marvel paintball team. It was the Marvel Punishers. Yeah. And uh, uh, we would, uh, you know, have like camo versions of, of uh, the, the skull uh, on our shirts when we go in there. I still and, have the patch you gave me. Yeah. There's actually two versions of it. The first one was uh, they did wrong. It was an embroidered patch. And they made it three teeth and nobody has a tooth in the middle. <laughs> so I made them go back and redo it. So the three tooth version is very rare. So if you've got that, Mike, you've got a collector's yeah. item. I'll have uh, to go look. We but, got um, noticed enough so that when West Point asked a group of, uh, of teams that played at this, uh, this field to come play the cadets at West Point, we got asked along. The first game on purpose, just a nervous, you know, it's basically a giant capture the flag thing. Yeah. So they didn't even leave anybody at their flag station. They all marched, you know, back or front to back, front to back, very close quarters, double time from their end of the field down to our end of the field, took the flag and marched back. Didn't matter how many of them we picked off. They just closed ranks and keep going. And we were just like, holy shit. <laughs> um, and, uh, I remember there was one game where I was the last person on the team left and all of these cadets are hunting me through the forest. That was one of the most, you know, even though it was paintball, that was one of the scariest moments I've ever experienced. At one point I got chased out on this little spit of land into a lake and there's no place left to go. I got one foot in the water and one foot on land. There's no place left to go. And I see all this movement in the woods coming at me. And I, I'm trying to rechange my CO2 fresh real fast. And I just got plastered. But um, one of the things that was great about playing the cadets is that they were honest, uh, totally honest. Sometimes you play in those public fields, you get people who start walking back to the dead zone after they get it with the paint and they, they wipe the paint off and I go back. Yeah. And, uh, these guys, like uh, I would, uh, you know, I'd hear over a bunch of foliage, hear them on the other side, and I can't shoot through it. So I would just mortar a bunch of rounds in the air and come down. And I, I couldn't see them, but they were taking themselves out if I hit them. Second time we went back there, uh, a lot of the, the seniors had graduated and been replaced with plebes. And we would get them to break and run from their defensive positions, uh, which was not something you do if you're a cadet. And I'm sure some of those guys are still doing push-ups to atone for that. Uh, uh, but it, it was it was a, it was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed that. Did any of uh, that stuff influence your uh, creation of uh, Alien Legion or anything? No, Alien Legion got started uh, way before that. I when I was uh, in my early 20s and trying to break into comics, I would do like a lot of people do. I'd, drop sample pages and send them in and 
um, you know, wait to try and get a response. And usually uh, if you got a response at all, it was a form letter months later. Um, right. Sometimes I'd write a quick little note at the bottom of it. But I was working on two stories at one point. One was sort of a, an all human foreign legion in space. And another different story was about a couple of aliens that were having a battle and one of them had this serpentine lower body. And this is an example I tell my students of, of uh, creativity is often juxtaposing things that uh, you don't normally think of, whether on purpose or accidentally. But I accidentally knocked all the pages for both of these stories off my bed onto the floor and they all got mixed up. And as I'm starting to sort them out, the light bulb goes off and I go, why on earth are all of these guys in this space born foreign legion humans? Yeah. And they should be led by this guy with the serpentine lower body. So that was always knocking around in the back of my head for a long time. I never had time to really do a whole lot with it until I got to Marvel. And even then, I was so busy uh, editing and drawing uh, other things that uh, I ended up uh, teaming up with uh, Alan Zalnitz and Frank Sirocco to, to bring out that initial series. That thing has been optioned more times than I probably got yeah. digits on one hand. And we sold. I sold it uh, 12 years or so go to Disney and Bruckheimer, they proceeded to have uh, half of Hollywood rewrite my screenplay, including um, David Benioff, uh, who turns out that the, one of the chief guys from Game of Thrones, turns out that he made me feel old. He told me he grew up in Brooklyn being an Alien Legion fan. Uh, <laughs> I ran out on the contract, uh, so it reverted back to me. Yeah. Uh, but there was a clause in there that Disney had that said, if I set it up elsewhere, uh, the deal has to include Disney being reimbursed for all their development costs. Wow. Guess how much money they blew on those seven rewrites? $10,000. More than that. Six million. So I had two deals set up with other major entities, uh, production entities, but neither one of them could close because uh, they could ridiculous. get Disney to cooperate yeah. uh, with a reasonable payback plan. But I've been in uh, recent months, I've been in uh, negotiations with uh, another situation. That I, I keep your fingers crossed. I think there's a chance that it might actually come, a, come about. I've got a, a top uh, producer and a top uh, director involved in, uh, you know, it seems like Hollywood's full of Alien Legion fans just trying to get this thing made with this Disney debt thing has, has been tough. So yeah. keep your fingers crossed. Let's Actually, see it. I've got uh, oh, nice. a Sargar uh, yeah. uh, enamel pin. Oh, cool. Uh, there, I'm going to get some more made. If you see me at a convention, come up. I'll give you one. <laughs> if it does work out, that would be for a movie and not a TV show. I think it would work great as a TV show, personally. But. Yeah, it was actually uh, one of the things we did a while ago is we pitched it at one of the major cable companies a while back as a series. I mean, it, it was built as a series. Right. Um, so it could go either way. Uh, I think it's like, again, I, I'm just slightly subjective on the subject, but I think, uh, you know, it's one of those things that uh, the universe is so big that and there's so many characters that you could, you know, have any kind of uh, spinoffs and things going on. Oh, know, oh um, yeah. I did want to ask about this because I swear you guys, they have the best names of the characters in Alien Legion. Were you the one that came up with that? Or was that Alan or a, a mixture of people? It was, it was a mixture, yeah. And then uh, Chuck also created a, a number of yeah. characters too as he came on. Yeah. Uh, but which names stick out to you? Do you recall? Oh, um, it just uh, obviously... Um, See, I mean, Jugger does, but yeah. uh, but like even like Miko, it's like yeah. that's that's perfect for his like it's it fits his character in Saragar and uh, just all, I just remember like every time that there would be like a new character or a new new name or whatever, mm -hmm. I'm like, that's where did they come up with these names? Like these names are perfect, and they're not like because a lot of times it will sound like oh well that could be in Star Trek or Star Wars or something, but it's like, man, these sound like these characters. Like, this is, okay. I, I don't know. I was Miko, impressed. Miko, I can't remember. I think that might have been Alan Zalnitz, but uh, another kind of Hollywood side story, there was a, when 
when it was optioned at Dimension many years ago, they hired a really good writer to write it. But this person uh, had written a bunch of stuff that wasn't science fiction. And, and I thought he didn't handle science fiction well. Right. But he took the name Miko and made it this really badass person. I'm going, that's the, <laughs> the, the, the word meek is built into the name. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that's not his also, character at all. He also, you know, created uh, a group of bad guys called the Horde, which had four people in it. I've never heard of a Horde with four people. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people that are really good writers out there. Uh, when you ask him to do science fiction or something fantastic in the fantastic uh, area, they have trouble creating a believable world and, and, you know, making sure they know all the who, what, where, when, why, and how answers yeah. to all of the fantastic elements, which I think the writers need to know, even yes. if they don't, even if yeah. they don't tell everything to the reader, that confidence that just comes across that they've got their world together just makes the reader feel confident in what they're reading. Yeah. No, Would I you, know exactly you, what, you, what you're talking about because it's like they have stereotypes in their head. And when they switch to a different genre like that, they start writing towards these like almost like B movie stereotypes of yeah. it's just it's like, no, you have to treat it like it's real. <laughs> and it's like you don't you don't do that and write and write corny just because you're not into it. Right. Carl, what would you say are the the first principles you present to your students who who come in and say, well, I want to write a story. What's important? What do I do? What do I have to know? Uh, there's a couple things. I, first off, I tell them, you know, every writer has to do what works best for them. But often they have to be careful because often what people think works best for them is the easy route. And that's often not the best way. I tell them that there's all different types of narratives. Uh, but the classic story arc is the one that is most universally resonates with people. It has been since at least the days of, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks. And basically that boils down to having one or more protagonists that um, have some sort of missing piece or problem that there's a, a catalyst uh, incident that propels them into an escalating series of events that um, eventually lead to a climax where either have learned to fill their missing piece or learn something or have an experience where that enables them to either succeed if you want it to be a, a so-called happy ending or fail if it's a tragic ending or uh, have an ironic mixed ending. Um, but, you know, that basic arc is at the heart of, um, you know, countless stories. Uh, you can do other types of things. You have mood pieces, character sketches, and so on. Uh, but if you want to affect the widest possible audience, it should have that classic arc, I think, generally. And so you feel that the protagonist must change during the course of the story? Or if you're doing a serial like we often do in comics, uh, the illusion of change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or or you, reinforce, you reinforce, you test, you test them and... They, it just reinforces that yeah they've got they've got it together in this aspect. You can't have Peter Parker just get whim whammed you know every other issue by some major change. You know you, you have to test his dedication to uh, being responsible after all that guilt he had for failing to stop the robber that killed his uncle and so on. Unless you again you're just trying to do some sort of mood piece or character sketch, um, which is viable. There's lots of good ones out there, uh, but. I think you need to really uh, test your characters and put them through some sort of art. See, I thought I had this down for a long time. And then I wrote this really long um, graphic novel script based on a couple of screenplays. I wrote. It's uh, one Bill Reinhold had been working on a graphic novel for eons now. I don't know if it's going to come out before I, I die. <laughs> uh, and it's based somewhat on my mother's family's history uh, during World War II. Uh, in the Philippines. One part of it deals with a 1st uh, Cavalry Division soldier and the arc he kind of goes through. And I gave it to the editor to read and I was all proud and happy. I'd been working on this thing for a long time. And he calls me up and he says, you know, I don't really think you push this character enough. He, he doesn't really 
go through hell and back. Uh, you know, he's just kind of like, uh, he gets his fingers singed. He doesn't really, he has to go into the pit with all kind of pit. And I I was right, initially kind of a bit righteously indignant. And I go, of course he is. I know what I'm doing. And I sit there and thought about it. And go, you know, it is, I like this guy so much. I didn't want to put him through hell. Um, so I went back and uh, I forced myself and it made it much better story. Uh, I think anyway, but that doesn't mean you can't write a perfectly entertaining and nice story where, you know, um, your main character in a way is sort of a catalyst for other people's arts. Like, you know, for a long time I edited the Hulk. You can't really do a hell of an arc with the Hulk, uh, especially when he's the, the dumb Hulk. Um, right. So basically he would act like as a catalyst uh, for changes or conflict in the guest star characters' stories or whatever. There are some people who can just come up with a, a story concept um, or a character and just sit down and they, they say like, they're, you know, let the story write itself. And there are a few people that can actually pull that off and they'll have a satisfying, entertaining story. But I think the vast majority of people do that are fooling themselves. You, and it usually ends up just like petering out or if they do, they have to come up with some deus ex machina thing to try and tie it up. Yep. So I believe in trying to, for me and for most of my students, I think it's best to combine both that creative instinct with an intellectual approach. I think if for most people, they do just one or the other, um, you can end up with that kind of, you know, meandering thing that doesn't pan out if it's just on the your creative instinct. But if you do too much of an intellectual approach where you're slavishly following somebody's beat right. sheet, you can do something that's, you know, crafted beautifully and be totally sterile and, and lifeless too. Um, so I tell them to come up with their main character and what that character's, where they start out and what you want, that, where they want them to end up with their goal is, what their problem is, and that they should have some sort of internal conflict, conflicting goals. Uh, know where you want them to start, know you where you want them to end up in the general route, just general, and then write the first draft from your gut. Don't think too much about the classic story arc or anything, because it's built into your head mostly anyway from your years of reading and looking at stuff. But write that first draft from your gut. Don't worry about beat sheets. Don't worry about any of that stuff. And then go back and compare what you wrote to a classic story arc, whether it's the, the writer's journey model or uh, the save the cat thing or whatever is popular at the moment and see where your story diverges and ask yourself as honestly as possible, would my story be better if I did make it adhere more tightly to a classic story arc or did I come up with something new and different that really works for this particular story? For me anyway, more often than not, I have to say, Jesus, you know, it would be better if I made it adhere more to the classic story. But once in a while, that's not the case. And the only way you, you'll come across that is if you're not slavish to a beat sheet or an arc when that first draft, you got to be able to to write it, um, you know, from your gut and explore things. So an example I use is like, say the character is going to be me. I know me. I'm originally from the San Francisco Bay Area. I decide uh, I'm sick of New York. I'm going to drive across the country and go back. Uh, to the Bay Area. So I know me, I know my goal, I know where I'm going to go, and I'm going to plan to take Highway 80. It goes right across the country, across the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, right? So then I write the first draft, and uh, so it'd be like driving, and I'd, you know, stop somewhere and meet somebody that I wasn't planning on it and have interaction or an adventure there. I, I see a, a sign for, you know, a museum of the world's biggest ball of yarn or whatever the hell it is, and yeah. go there and do and, I, and as I'm going near Chicago, I hear on the radio that my my favorite all-time band is going to reform for one night only in four days. So I end up hanging around Chicago for four days and having adventures that I didn't plan on. But eventually, I keep going back to Highway 80 and going, uh, you know, towards the west. And somewhere along the way, someone says something to me that makes me realize that all the things I like about San Francisco, you know, I like the, the weather there. Unlike Mark Twain, I like the weather there. Um, and um, uh, I like, you know, the, the music scene. I like the culture. I love Golden Gate Park. It makes Central Park look like a desert. Um, and uh, I like the fishing. Uh, you know, I've got relatives and friends out there. 
So I'm going to move, move back there. But uh, as I'm driving across the country, someone makes me remember that I hate those goddamn hills. They yeah. drive me nuts. The stop sign is right before the apex. And if you're driving a stick shift, oh, my God. Um, yeah. And I hate walking them and all that. So, so all the things I like are further down the coast without those hills in the Carmel, Monterey area, all that. So I end up moving down there. But the only reason I moved down there is because my original target was San Francisco. So everything happens in context to get me where I'm going. If I just got in my car and started meandering across the country towards the west, I might have an interesting incident or two. But I'd just be meandering around. It wouldn't hold together. And it would probably just fizzle out at some point. So that's why I think it's best to combine that creative instinct with that intellectual approach, at least for most people. But there are always, you know, outliers that can pull things off that I can't comprehend on both the art and the writing side. Uh, you guys familiar with the Korean artist Kim Jung Ji? I, I am. A little oh, bit. he's the guy that just starts drawing and never lifts his his thing yeah. from the. Yeah, I've seen him work. He must be a mutant. I mean, <laughs> I can't comprehend how he does that because I thought at first when I saw the videos that he must have like, you know, blue pencil on the wall that the camera isn't picking up. But I saw him do it live. And there was nothing up there. It was this giant wall. And they'll go over here and do a little bit over here and a little bit up there, a little bit down. And eventually, it all comes together in this amazing uh, fisheye perspective that I'm just flabbergasted at. I can't, I can't even comprehend pulling that off. So the same thing with writing. There, sometimes people can do things in writing, but uh, I think they're pretty, pretty rare. So I think that that method I just outlined to you probably works the best for most of my students. For a long time, I would just sit down and wing it. And that's how I wrote comics for, for 20 years. As you knew, I would sit down and I draw the page out on a legal pad, start with the first panel. And I think, well, how do I begin this? How do I grab the reader's attention? And then when I had that first panel settled, I look at the second panel and ask myself, well, what happens next? What's logical? What continues the story? And it was a very important lesson. And I would encourage anybody who wants to get into comics to try that because it forces you to think about what happens next. And that's the essential question in all fiction because mm. the reader has to care about what happens next before he turns the page. Uh, and I would just wing it. And I had that classic structure in my head that a story is a dynamic narrative with the beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's like a good pop song in, in that it's got the tonic and then it's got the bridge and then it's got the hook. In other words, the story proceeds like this. Because if the story proceeds like this, it's boring. The reader's not going to be interested. Right. Uh, but for the last 20 years, I've become a firm believer in outlines. So now I outline everything, whether it's a novel or a comic book run. Uh, but no matter how detailed the outline or how much I love it, invariably, I find that when writing the book, those those uh, divergence pop up and you and you veer away from the the outline, uh, and it always makes for a better story. Yeah. Do you still do thumbnails for everything? No, I don't. I draw when I have to. When somebody mm. doesn't understand something, like when I'm working with a foreign artist, but otherwise it's it's just script style, and I have very terse descriptions in my uh, scripts. Uh, you're the you're the anti Alan Moore. <laughs> yeah. You could say that. I, I'll never forget, <laughs> I was at Steve Rude's house one day, and he was illustrating a story. I want to make sure I get this right. I don't want to finger the wrong guy. Uh, uh, the writer was one of those great artists. Who did who did Camelot 2000? Uh, Bolin. Bolin, Bolin. Yeah, I don't Brian think Bolin. I don't think it was Brian Bolin. I think it, it was uh, that other guy with the black hair. Uh, and Alan Moore worked with him a lot. And anyhow, the dude is, was working on this story for him. It was a commission for one of the majors. Just, he says, do you want to see a piece of shit? Do you want to see a piece of shit? And he held up this script that was this thick. And he threw it against the wall. The pages went everywhere. Alan should have learned how to draw so he could just do it all himself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah, there's, you know, and I've seen scripts um, because a lot of people will... Um, I tr I try not to do this, but I've seen scripts where they put a lot of uh, like links in the script where people can click to follow for references for right. art. And but I mean I've seen where they have like two hundred links like for, for the guy, yeah. from them to follow on. Like that's insane. Yeah. 
I do that, but there's maybe three links per, per script. Right. It's for all, it's all for technical stuff, a vehicle or a weapon. When Mike and I work together, there were no such thing as links. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. What, what's, um, I, I am curious because I know in your thing, you did, um, like it says in your thing that you, yeah, that you've kind of, uh, mentored a lot of different, um, artists and stuff, which I mean, many of them are my favorites. And, um, but I'm curious, like what kind of, uh, different, I don't know, advice and, and different things did you deal with, um, with, uh, with all them? I, I mean, I will say, I mean, most of them have very, they definitely kind of developed their own styles and stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was, I like a diversity of, of styles and approaches, but the con constant thing I, I like is, uh, people who are, you know, strong with the visual storytelling generally, that's, that's the, the consistent thing. I like, uh, generally clear and compelling visual storytelling. Um, there's sometimes the people that are more design oriented right. and, um, occasionally they'll do things that, you know, on the storytelling side, which will make me go, Oh my goodness. But the page just looks so friggin' good that uh, sometimes I'll turn a blind eye to it for at least some aspects of it. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, as far as actual styles go, the people I worked with were, it's, you know, quite a range. People yeah. uh, people would drive me nuts when they say, oh, it's, you know, there's a Marvel style. And I go, and I go I've got in my office, yeah. I've got Sal Buscema, Jim Lee, Mark Badger, uh, you know, June Brigman. Yeah, Larry Tell me where the Marvel style is and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, it was, uh, I think it's just one of those things where it's a convenient thing to right. say sometimes for people who didn't really think it through. Um, yeah. It's a oh, little bit more. Not to mention Mignola was in there too. Right. Yeah, exactly. It was Larry Stroman, one of the ones that had the design stuff that would kind of. Once in a while, Larry's design stuff. I, I mean, uh, I love Larry's yeah, stuff. So do I. He's very de design yeah. <laughs> Oriented. Yeah. Once, once in a while, the design stuff would overwhelm the the clarity of the storytelling, but it was just so freaking beautiful. Oh I yeah, he was so into it that, uh, uh, you know, I, I I just sit there and look at the pages and drool. They look great. Yeah. One of the things that uh, I ended up doing kind of accidentally was was sort of evolving a um, a professional baseball sort of way of dealing with all the new talent. I had my um, my dub, my professionals working on the, the, the monthly titles, uh, my AAA people were those that I was uh, either, ha you know, giving them like short jobs or filling issues or things like that, you know, waiting for their shot at the big time. And then the AA people were those that I thought showed talent but needed a lot of work. And I'd assign them this six page story called Double Vision that Tom DeFalco had written. That was very difficult to fit into the six pages. It was very condensed storytelling. You had to really know what you were doing. I still use parts, aspects of that story when I'm, I'm working with my students that uh, just trying to fit all the different pieces of visual storytelling into a condensed amount of space. That's that's one of the big things I go over with my, my students because I'll give them a, an exercise where I'll give them a, a short paragraph for an establishing scene and I'll say, tell this as clearly as possible in the fewest panels possible. And they'll freak out because they got to put all this information in there. And they'll start breaking down each bit of information into its own panel, or maybe they'll combine a couple of things in there. And, uh, you know, some will take seven panels. And, uh, and I'll show them that it took me a long time to work it out, but I worked it out for one panel. The finished thing makes it look easy. It's like, it seems self-evident, but, I was pounding my head against the wall to come up with this solution over and over again. And that's one of the things, whether you're writing or drawing, visual storytelling, whatever, is that I liken it to being a ballet dancer. A good ballet dancer makes their performance look effortless. You don't see all the practice that went into it. You don't, they don't show you that they're landing on a stubbed toe or a twisted ankle or a bad knee. Right. Because if they do, if they, they start grunting or groaning or limping or whatever, you might have sympathy for them. Uh, but they've taken you out of the flow of the story or the narrative or, or whatever. 
So if you show you're struggling to tell the story by breaking each little piece down in its own little panel and all that, that affects the reader negatively. Trying to fit a lot of information in, into a re, you know, reasonably small amount of space, uh, the reader just picks up on stuff subconsciously that sets them up for what's coming afterwards. And that's not an easy thing to pick up. I, when I first started professionally, I had no idea what visual storytelling was. I was just, if I drew a figure that I thought came out well, it was going on the panel. It didn't matter if it was what was suited you know, for it or not, but I got into doing storyboards for New York ad agencies and that made me have to work fast and tell stories you know, for 30 seconds very quickly. And uh, I think that's that was a really good training ground for me. Something that right. people, um, anybody who wants to do comics or or any kind of storytelling medium, like you have, um, what and writers too. I mean, a lot of times you have a certain time frame that a story has to be in, or a certain amount of pages, or whatever. And it's like you have to learn how to communicate what you're communicating, and it's really hard to do if you don't have any idea of like what the structure is and how to do things like that. Um, I did want to ask because I heard, I, and I don't know that he does it every time, but I know. Um, uh, Chuck Dixon and I, I've done this and I, I've, I know other people that have done it too, but I, I know Chuck Dixon for a while was like, he was always, and I'm sure a lot of it was because of he had, you know, whatever, three or four books coming out a month and he's just cranking fast. Um, but a lot of times, um, he was writing the beginning and the end, and then he'd fill the middle in later. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I think it's like I mentioned earlier, I think it's important that you, know when you start out writing what the beginning is and what you think the ending is going right. to be so it keeps you focused even if you end up you know diverting yeah. at some point there are a handful of novelists who never outlined uh, elmore leonard was one of them so he he was the kim jong ji of novelists yeah that's exactly <laughs> exactly right. another one is peter Branbold, the western writer he's probably the most popular western writer in the world right now uh, but Peter has an advantage in that each story has the same template in that it's always a revenge story. Mm. And uh, his protagonist uh, uh, comes across a, 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 an injustice or an injustice is done to him in the early part. And then the rest of the story is getting even. Yeah. And, and that's what Western fans like. Yeah, that's something else that I talk to my students about is genre expectations. Like if you're doing a detective novel or something, there's certain things that have to be in there. And as uh, Robert McKee puts it, you have to give them what they expect, but not the way they expect it in order to work. Every Western ends with a showdown in a dusty street between the main protagonist and antagonist. Uh, it's hard. I can't even name a Western where that doesn't happen. Sometimes there's slight variations like, uh, the Good, Bad, and the Ugly, it's a three-way showdown in a cemetery, right? So <laughs> uh, not that much difference. But so if that's, and if you don't do that, the, the Western fan is going to be pretty unhappy. So your your uh, your job is to give them what they expect, but not the way they expect it. Um, one of the things I, I show my students is I show them the, the climactic scenes for, for first for your Jimbo. Um, and then I show them how they got ripped off for a fistful of dollars and uh, how even when you're ripping off someone else's story, if you give it to the audience in a way they don't expect, it's entertaining and, and it'll work. Which uh, reminds me that of the old axiom, there are only seven plot plots in the world that are done over and over again. And I must also point out that Yo Jimbo was based on Dashiell Hammett's Red Harvest. For real? Yeah. Wow. What what year was that written? Oh, it was uh, in the 30s. Wow. Now you should read it. It's a terrific book. Huh. Same plot. Uh, yeah. a, an outsider comes into a town with two warring clans, and he plays one against the other to get what he wants. But they don't always work out when they do. There was that one with Bruce Willis uh, about um, down in Texas and Mexico or something like that. Last man standing. That's right. Yeah. You know, you think you'd have all the ingredients there for it, the, the setting and Bruce Willis, you should have all the ingredients for a, a memorable film. But 
This movie is a gangster remake of Clint Eastwood's A Fistful of Dollars, which is a Western remake of Yo Jimbo, which is a samurai adaptation of Dashiell Hammett's Red Harvest. <laughs> <laughs> you ever look to see if Dashiell Hammett was uh, yeah. influenced by anything? Plato. Could have been, but but uh, he was kind of an original, and uh, it, uh, and he and Raymond Chandler uh, invented the modern noir detective novel. One of the other things I talk to my students about uh, when when it comes to writing is that um, at some point, uh, it can even be after you've completed it, uh, your your initial story uh, writing. I think it's good to come up with a uh, thematic statement that you think the whole every element within the story reinforces. Um, I agree. And um, like that that one that I'm working on, the World War II one uh, with Bill Reinhold, um, uh, it's based on a quote that I think it was Churchill's uh, military doctor said, um, something on the lines of, war has no power to transform. It merely exaggerates the good and ill that are already within us, which I, to a certain degree, I, I agree with, but I still think it's possible to just take, you know, someone who's all goodness and light and just put them through so much crap that they ended up right. you know, turning toxic. Uh, but I, I get what he's saying. And I, I think to a large degree, that's what it's about. And that's what the main character uh, in the story goes through. With Alien Legion, um, it, it's more along the lines of, um, I'm a big World War II history buff and movie buff. And uh, a lot of family history on both sides of the family there. And so that helped inspire me with Alien Legion because um, you had <clears throat> the, the Western allies, if we conveniently forget we were allied with Stalin, yeah. uh, you had the more democratic, diverse Western allies that despite their problems were much more diverse uh, than the xenophobic, uh, fascistic uh, Axis powers. And the Axis powers, you know, the Germany had this professional army that they'd been building up for a long time. And Japan had this long military tradition and thought they, you know, were superior. And, you know, Mussolini was just trying to tag along, I guess. Uh, but um, uh, they couldn't believe that, uh, you know, an army of uh, citizen soldiers that were made up of all these people, families that had, had families immigrated not that many generations ago to the U.S., could be molded into an army that could take on these professionals. And, uh, you know, you got units with, uh, you know, a farmer from Texas and a mechanic from Brooklyn and a teacher from Philadelphia. And all these guys ended up uh, mm -hmm. the crap out of these, uh, these people. So uh, the basic Alien Legion thematic statement is something along the lines that a diverse democratic uh, society despite all the problems that it has is ultimately stronger than a, a xenophobic fascistic uh, society that's what i think a lot of world war ii was about again there's lots of imperfections on on the ally side there right um ultimately i think that's what it comes down to so alien legion i i amped that up by having the most diverse ranks you can have possible yeah. of different cultures and species and all that having often where you know they don't get along but they ultimately that diversity is a strength against the more xenophobic uh alien foes like the harkalons and so on right yeah yeah thank you carl yeah are, are is there are there uh specific places you'd you'd like people to follow you online or where they can even see uh, some of your lectures or whatever i mean i'm on facebook but i'm starting I, at some point i've got to separate my personal profile from my right general yeah. public profile because they're all mixed up now and it just gets nuts and there yeah. is also i i know it's been it has it, it it's been a while since it's been updated but i know you do have uh alienlegion.com for anyone yeah. who does want to see more about that and yeah. uh well thank you very much for being on we will let you go and um go lecture or whatever what whatever else you're uh, today see. today yeah. today it's it's house repairs <laughs> oh fun those are great you yeah, know fun yeah, especially when it, the, the high today is going to be like 45, I think. Oh, oh, nice. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure, guys. Take care. Yeah.
Hey, Sean is back with another uh, crowdfunding thing. And uh, this one is very different from his last one. At least it, it, it seems like it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you may you may remember him as the uh, AI expert, right? Yeah, I do AI in my day job. Um, and that was for the Killing Machine. And uh, Killing Machine is going to go uh, out digitally uh, tomorrow. And it's going to the printer tomorrow as well. So it will be... Oh, cool. um, you know, available in the world in uh, in a couple of weeks uh, in print form. So really excited about that one. We we did about two hundred percent on Kickstarter. So thanks to everyone who uh, who jumped jumped in on that one. Yeah, yeah. So um, okay, I got I got to ask first. Okay, with Wood Steak, did the name come first or did the idea come first? <laughs> it kind of came at the same time. Like you know, I think yeah. Wood Steak hit me, and then it was like, oh yeah. A vampire <laughs> Woodstock, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's just so much possibility, um, and uh, and possibility for comedy. You know, I mean, it really is trying to be a, a right. horror comedy mashup. I would say the first issue is a little more horror um, because we got to set the stage for everything. But um, right. you know, there's appearances, you know, with a lot from a lot of people. You know, references and jokes about Pete Townsend and Wavy Gravy and. You know, <laughs> for people who are from that era, there's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of uh, interesting, interesting stuff in there. But yeah, yeah you know, one thing I tried really hard was to get the details right. So I actually, yeah. you know, researched it well. And, um, you know, the way the music interacts with the story, it really fits the timeline. So oh, cool. you know, on Friday at five o'clock when Richie Havens was playing, Richie Havens is playing. And, oh, uh, cool, cool. you know, so um, and actually it worked out quite well. You know, there's a scene where the vampire rises, um, you know, at the end of Saturday night. And it just so happened that that's when Credence was on playing bad moon on the rise. So oh, um, wow. there was some fun stuff in that where you were like, I was looking at the play sets hour by hour and plotting out the story. And, uh, I tried really hard to get the details, right. So it's not somebody, you know, just kind of taking the idea of Woodstock, but I tried to really integrate it into the festival, like exactly what happened. Man. Yeah. You should, you should, uh, if you haven't already or, or whatever, but, uh, yeah, you should have playlists together for people to listen Definitely. to with, with their uh, when they read it or whatever. That would be that would be super cool. Um, yeah, the music for the video. I don't know. Kevin had some guy. I mean, that just sounds pure. Yeah. Hits, you know. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, it's great. You know, it's royalty free, but it's very much in the in the vein of Hem Hendrix. But yeah, I could do a great playlist just of songs referenced in in the comic book, um, you know, uh, yeah. whether their performances from Woodstock or some other performance, but yeah, a lot of great stuff. So how many yeah. issues is this going to be? I'm planning it to be seven issues. Um, so I like the killing machine. I wrote this one up as a screenplay as well. So it's like a 130 page screenplay. Um, and, um, uh, it, it's going to take a while to tell the story. Like the first issue is just called the road to Woodstock and the festival hasn't started yet because, there's yeah. backstory to, you know, why is there a vampire in upstate New York? And, uh, right. you know, and who are the hippies that uh, that are our main characters? And um, so there was uh, not not to say the issue is not um, action packed. It is like it, it starts and ends with right. um, vampire attacks. Um, so it's it's fun. But um, but there's a lot to set up, I, you know, and I probably won't even really hit the festival till the end of uh, the second issue. Um, so, yeah, I'm planning it to be seven issues um, to wrap this story up. Um, well, if you can share this, not like a spoiler thing, is there anything uh, with like the vampires or the vampire mythology that you play with or do your own twist on? Yeah, no, it's a great question. I kind of stuck with a more classic vampire approach. So uh, one of my taglines is classic vampires, classic rock. Um, right. So, you know, I was, uh, I was really taken with um, Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, right. and, um, so that's, that's the Dracula that it comes out of. And, uh, yeah. my, my Dracula, um, Vladimir, um, Alnwick is his name, um, you know, kind of coming down from Vlad the Impaler and some right. of the traditional, um, vampire, uh, lore is definitely in the Bram Stoker model of, of a vampire. So I didn't mess around with the, um, vampire mythology mu much, um, right. it's really just mixing up the vampire with the hippies, you know, there's right. scenes where right. vampire gets stoned with a hippie and, you know, vampire feeds on somebody who just dropped LSD and then vampire, you know, Vladimir starts right, to right. LSD. And so, you know, that's the direction it goes. It, it's, it's uh, hopefully scary and funny, a good story, but there's also like just so much to play with, with this idea of this, you know, free hippie culture and, uh, and this, you know, what's interesting as well is the hippies were just so optimistic, particularly at Woodstock. 
right uh, you know and so you just nothing... you just have to dash their hopes by, hey, by putting vampires there's on. nothing more cynical than a vampire right so like you know yeah. just someone who sucks their lifeblood and leaves their corpse by the side of the road right so the yeah. bringing together of the ultimate optimist and the ultimate cynic uh is uh is yeah kind of what drives it yeah yeah that's cool well um as people should be able to tell from the from the little bit of the trailer there um it has really good art um how did yeah. you get how did you uh get hooked up with that and who yeah, all so are the, the artist team? is uh his name's philippe kroll um he's from brazil and he had actually done some really great stuff um and he's done he did some things uh, you know for the sandman not you know just he riffed on the sandman just to right. get his stuff right. out there um but he's got a really interesting style um he's got a very cinematic vision which i like um and he also um he uses a 3d modeling tool when he does his sketching so cool. he will um you know the camera is camera is you know moving around like you know you're really right. you're up top looking down on things you're you know at different angles so he'll build out the scene rough in a rough model right and fly the camera around until he finds something he really likes and then yeah. start to build out the detail um and he also paints it's digitally painted but you see right. brush strokes and all of that so um right. once again a totally different look from killing machine which is really yeah. clear lined you know right. very photoshoppy very bright colors this is the opposite um yeah you know in fact our test prints were a little dark um we have to figure out how to adjust right. for the printer because it looks yep. great on the monitor but it comes yeah. out a little muddy on the printing so um uh, we got to work through that, but yeah, no, he's, he's great. And I think, you know, um, I hope, you know, I think he's going to do very well with this. I just hope people don't come steal him away from me before he does my, my first seven issues, you know? <laughs> yeah. I was going to say seven issues. That's a, that's a long time, but he, uh, yeah, but, um, painted, um, looks great, especially for horror stuff. Um, really yeah. works well, um, I agree. for that. And, uh, yeah, I've had some similar issues. Like I absolutely love like painted comics and stuff. Um, but yeah, I've had some issues too in the past of dealing with, uh, just with the way that, yeah, the way that it, it, it translates when it actually gets printed and that whole process and the way that it comes out and, and, uh, yeah, it, it can be, it can be tricky, but I mean, once you, once you get it, get it worked out, yeah, it looks, looks really, really, really good. Well, that's indie comics. You never thought you were going to dive deep into the details of offset printing, but there you, there right. you are. You got to do what you got to do. So, yeah. yeah. Yep. Especially, Even though you're working with like ink for marketing and stuff, it's like you still have to be on social media. You still have to do stuff. You still have to do silly interviews like this. Yeah, um, I like but, these interviews. These are fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's. I, I mean, honestly, I mean, it's great. Like me, me as a creator too. Like I love doing them. And I mean, it's like why? Why would you hate talking about something that you created? You exactly. Know, that, that yeah. is your that is, that is your uh, child and everything. Um, well, and the community is so great. I mean, you're a creator. You yeah. get it. People really get it. So it's it's kind of like those conversations you have in the hallway of a Comic Con or something that right. we haven't been having for the last two years. So it's got to happen right. somehow. I think I, I think it's a great idea. Um, I know a lot of people are going to be uh, probably be upset that they they didn't th think of it because um, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it is that it's it's definitely well, well one of those things. Yeah, I'm actually I'm surprised. I don't know how serious you got with the. Uh, with the screenplay or whatever, but I'm surprised it didn't get, um, yeah, I'm surprised somebody didn't go for it just based on the, um, concept alone. It seems like a good, um, it seems like a good fit, especially for horror stuff. Yeah. But, you know, this is an easy tagline, right? So a vampire, right. rock, everybody gets it. That's your elevator pitch. You don't need to go any further. Um, killing machine was a lot harder to sell. Right. Uh, screenplay did it, it made it to, you know, through to um as a second rounder at Austin and um for any oh, screenwriters cool. out there, the Austin Film Festival is a great screenwriter festival because they it's yeah. wall to wall conferences. Like you're meeting um producers and agents and you know whatever. Right, and, having, right, you know, right. and I, I did, I got some good feedback, but um, you know, there's a difference between someone saying that's a cool concept and someone saying I'm gonna fund that, right? Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, you know, in a way. Uh, I actually love this as a comic. I think it could very much be a movie and maybe when it is a comic and people can see it realized it will, it will generate more interest in that direction. But for, for me right now, it's like, I want to get this done as a comic book. I think it's going to be great. So, okay. And, and I have to ask, you know, they did another Woodstock. Have you, have you thought about a, Oh yeah. Sequel story at all. Yeah. Woodstock 99 is the sequel. Um, yeah. So I definitely left, uh, left the door open for Vladimir at the end um, yeah. to come back. And I also think what's great is that you can, 
you know, just as a contrast between 1969 and 1999 and the first Woodstock right. and, and the Woodstock of 1999, the cultural shift and, you know, everything right. around it. So um, I think, you know, I think uh, aside from being fun, I think there is something kind of relevant in in looking at right. the politics through this lens not the politics but the social politics you know everything that was going yeah, on everything yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah and if you move that forward 30 years i think it gives a really nice contrast to it so oh yeah but you know um uh i'm not going to tie philippe up for 14 issues so <laughs> one step yeah. at a time right and I, and I gotta say i i love the fact again that it is uh that you've got finished it as a whole screenplay because um then i mean because a lot of and i hate to say this Cause I'm in that, I'm in the indie comic thing too and putting stuff out, but there's a lot of people who haven't really, uh, a lot of creators who haven't figured out the kind of end game and where the story is going. They kind of have, you know, the big idea in the beginning and, it, and, and obviously, I mean, sometimes you leave it open-ended because you're just like, you don't know how long it, it might go, but, um, but yeah, it is great. Um, yeah. Seven issues is, is ambitious, but man, if you guys pull it off, yeah, it will be, it will be very, very cool. Um, yeah. And, you yeah. know, I find it's a constant battle of reworking it. Like I've got this whole screenplay, right. but, the, but the finished, you know, seven comic books will be quite different than the screenplay. Um, right. You know, it, it's really interesting developing it serially, as you know, like you, you know, yeah. once, once issue one is in print, then you're limited in terms of what you can change. But, right. but you still have a much longer time where, you know, people give you feedback, people, t you know, you know, what's working, what's not yeah. working. And you have that, that chance to kind of develop it deeply over time because your first yeah. pass at something is never, you know, never your best. I mean, you can always go deeper or tweak it or find another approach. So um, yeah, you just got to avoid writing yourself into a corner where you can't uh, contradict something that happened earlier. Yeah. 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 Um, so uh you just so people know where to find it. This is on Zoop, right? Yeah, this one's on Zoop. Um, so we're, we're giving Zoop a whirl. Um, so Zoop, for people who don't know, is a crowdfunding um, platform just for comics. Um, right. And um, unlike, it's a little different than Kickstarter. It's a little simpler in some ways. I mean, there's just your rewards and your add-ons are separate. Um, and um, we're actually offering a special. So you can get the, the PDF for a $3 you know, contribution which is pretty awesome, you know, I mean, yeah. um, you know, or come by and drop a buck in the tip jar, um, you know, because I, I do think this is the kind of thing where we're building an audience over time and, you know, get the first issue digitally for three bucks. And if you like it, then there's going to be issue two. And, you know, each issue will have more rewards because you can get the catch up bundle and, you know, all that stuff. And, you right. know, but um, yeah, so, you know, fingers crossed that things go well on Zoop. They, they have more of a you know, they, they, they hold things more in house. You don't edit your own story. They do all of that. You provide the material and they build the website and they build right, the right. and all of that. Um, and they use a lot of mailing lists as opposed to social media. So um, that's where Inked Marketing is helping me out a little bit by, you know, continuing to push on social. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a big experiment, but hopefully it'll work out. Um, how long is your... Um... Oh, or it, it just it keeps on going for Zoop. Well, that's right? the thing with Zoop, right? So you can with Kickstarter, the two things you can't change are the timing and the amount of money. But with right. Zoop, you can change either of those things. So we're set up for 30 days. Um, as you know, a lot of Kickstarter campaigns or crowdfunding campaigns, you get a big bump at the beginning, they lull, and then they peak again at the end. So right. I don't know how long it it's worth extending out if we're going to extend it out. Um, but right. yeah, we'll see. We're set up for 30 days, so it's supposed to go through the end of this month. And just for creators out there, they have two plans. Uh, one is kind of a 10%. They take 10% and um, you do, um, you know, the fulfillment and the marketing and a lot of other things. Um, right. They have a plan for 25% where they do everything. They'll do the fulfillment, you know, the shipping, all of that for you. So, right. um, you know, uh, depending on, on what you want to do, it takes a lot of the burden off you. So it's a, it's very different than Kickstarter in that, in that regard because they're really set up to handle right. fulfillment for comic book you know, campaigns. So it'll be nice for you to be able to, to blame them if something, if something. Yeah. Is I did the 10% package. Cause so, so you can blame me when your package doesn't. Yeah. Come. Okay. I'm going to try really hard to get them out. Um, you know, killing, you know, it, it, there's a certain amount of time, you know, like you have to wait two weeks for Kickstarter to collect everything, the money and right. then you gotta do the surveys. Yep. But, um, yeah, so Killing Machine ended February 15th, and I'm going to have everything in the mail, you know, by next week. So that's, you know, four weeks, four calendar yeah. weeks to get it out. And I hope to do the same thing with uh, with Woodstake is just, you know, get them out the door and thank you very much. And here you go. You know, because yeah. nobody wants to sit around and wait for it. Yeah, I would encourage people after we're, we're finishing now, um, if you want to go either go to Zoop and uh, and check it out there 
or you can watch our thing um, here again and, and yeah, actually look at the art and notice uh, it's great when you have people that know how to do all the wrinkles and clothes and everything yeah. else and stuff. I mean, he, I mean, he's, he, he's really good. That was one of the first things when I, when I saw, I'm like, okay, yeah, it's a good idea. And then I saw the art and I'm like, okay, yeah, this is, this is really, really cool. It's like, this is um, probably one of the uh, more special um, crowdfunding things I've seen this year so far. Like I Thank just you. like, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, that's, that looks, that looks really cool. I, I, I uh, yeah. I, yeah. When I saw his art, I was like, that's, I just knew like, that's, that's this project. Um, oh, I got to yeah. get this guy. Um, and, uh, and then when he started doing the first drawings and paintings, it was like, yeah, yeah, this is exactly what I had in mind. So, um, nice. you know, the best case scenario is people will be annoyed because they have to wait first you too, because we're waiting for Philippe to paint things. That would be the best case scenario. Right, right. Because we right, have a big right. fan base that wants issue two, right? Yeah. Right, right. Does the Inked have a uh, link for you? Yeah, you can go to inked.pub um, slash woodstake, or you can go to zoop.gg. Uh, it's slash C slash woodstake, but just go to zoop.gg. It's on the homepage or right. um, on your links. Um, it's not hard to find. $3 right. DRM free PDF, can't beat it. And then we've got printed copies and collector's editions and signed and a pearl linen print and, you know, all kinds nice. of nicer stuff if you want to go that way. But, um, you know, grab your DRM print, you know, free, uh, free PDF for three bucks. Oh yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for being here. I uh, wish you all the success on it. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm excited. I'll be, I'll be excited to uh, see where it goes. But... Thanks so much. And thanks for having me on again. I appreciate it. Yep. No problem. I'll see you. See you.